face to face for him to be able to say have a say so. I'm talking well, about no. what Alex said. He never said nothing about no baby. If somebody got a child, they gonna say, "Well, this is my baby here, mama. Look, look at my baby." I tried to sign the birth certificate. Isaiah Hendricks, not I Isaiah Pacheco. I cannot make him. And Pacheco. for me, but yeah, but every time I called you and I told you for us to How make an appointment, you never wanted to do it. You always had excuses it's for like, everything. It's like a process. I called him and told him that I was being induced. Never know when the baby's gonna come. He yeah. stayed for the first 24 hours and he left. I didn't later. show up, but why? What did I tell later. you? I was doing. doing what was I, I doing? Know. I was at work. Just when you thought the drama maxed out, Miss Thomas drops a bombshell, accusing Mr. Hadley of leading a scandalous double life and denying her son, Jeremiah. He claims Mr. Hadley flips roles, playing dad when with her, and then denying the child with his current squeeze. Miss Stallworth, she suggests Miss Stallworth is the puppet master, manipulating Mr. Hadley into denial. But grab your popcorn because this ride is just getting started. Thomas, you claim you're involved in a love triangle that has resulted in the defendant denying your seven month old son, Jeremiah. You've petitioned the court for a paternity test to prove that he is the father so he can stop living a double life. Yes. The plot thickens as Miss Thomas spills that when Miss Stallworth is out of the picture, Mr. Hadley slips into the dad jeans quite comfortably. She presents a snapshot to the court, supposedly showing Mr. Hadley snoozing next to Jeremiah, which he disputes but then kinda admits he was indeed there, snoozing away. Strap in. The next chapter in this saga is a doozy. He doesn't watch him, however, if he's crying, he'll go to him, pick him up, make sure he doesn't fall off the bed, he'll give him his bottle. Well, with all due respect, Your Honor, um, I don't think anyone would just let a child fall off the bed. He's the one that stands up by the crib and pats his back the whole time until he falls asleep. As the stakes rise, paternity puzzle gets messier with their tangled sexual history coming to light. Mr. Hadley admits to rolling the dice without protection during their escapades around the time Jeremiah was conceived. He's skeptical about his daddy status, though, thanks to the timing Miss Thomas's playbook, including another man. Hold tight, because there's more juicy drama just around the corner. Benefits? Was it friends and you were having sex as yes, well? Yeah. It didn't lead to sex until way later on. But I you did have a sexual relationship. Yeah. Did you use protection when you had sex? The first time. Only two times out of all of them. Twice. In a twist that feels straight out of a soap opera, Mr. Hadley confesses to feeling cornered into playing the proud papa at Jeremiah's birth, caving to family pressure to ink his last name on the newbie. As the courtroom absorbs this twist, you won't believe what's up next. More gasps guaranteed. Number one, her family member brought me to the hospital. You know, out of respect, you know, everything I'm going. So while I'm there, they're about to name the child, and she said the child's last name is going to be Had. And her whole family's Jamaican, so it's a whole bunch of Jamaicans in the room. She's, they, they're like, oh, is the child's last name going to be Had? Hadley. Amidst an ever-thickening plot, an inconclusive home DNA test throws everyone for a loop, with Mr. Hadley scratching his head over the iffy results and sticking to his guns about not being the father. Convo dives deeper into Miss Thomas's other rendezvous during conception time, and just when you think it can't get any wilder, the next moment will flip the script. Well, we also had a home DNA test done, and the results were inconclusive. Did you bring any evidence of that test? The test was inconclusive. Yes, anything can mess up an at-home DNA test. You have practically perfect. You're up for a curveball as the trio untangles their complicated living and loving arrangements. Mr. Hadley admits his residential ping pong between the two women, stirring up the emotional pot even more. Fasten your seat belts because the truth train is pulling into the station next. Stayed over our house. He lives with. I don't. He has I don't his live clothes with, at my with, house. With, where do you live? No, he doesn't. Now you live with Miss Stallworth. Yeah. No. But your clothes are at Miss Thomas. <laughs> he yes. lives with me. Who are you intimate with right now? Uh, Miss Stallworth. Miss Stallworth. It's yeah. a back and forth. It's been like that for two years. Dive deeper into this tangled web as it's revealed that Mr. Hadley and Miss Stallworth also share a child, layering this love triangle with extra complications. The court ponders the future fallout if Mr. Hadley is indeed Jeremiah's pops. You might want to sit down for this. Things are about to get even more twisted. Me and Mr. Hadley will just co-parent with our daughter and nothing further. He's been trying to... So you to have a child as well? Yes, we do. We have a baby girl. So this has been a love triangle that's been going on for a while. Yes. yes. A long, long And while. you just go back and forth, mister, depending on whose house you stay in. Yes. Well, it was like when she would get mad at me a lot of times and she would, for no reason. She's as the anticipation peaks, the DNA test results are finally unveiled. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Had, you are not his father. You won't believe this roller coaster. Ms. Smathers explains why she has brought Mr. Stevens to court. Devastated that he denies being the biological father of her son, Adrian, she asserts that the DNA test results are crucial for their future as a family, highlighting the stakes involved. And boy, does it get spicier from here. Strap in for Mr. Stevens' fiery rebuttal. Ms. Smathers, you have dragged the defendant to court because you are devastated. He refuses to accept that he is your son's biological father. You claim today's DNA results will have a dramatic impact as a family.
Yes, Your Honor. Here's where it gets juicy. Mr. Stevens counters the claim by stating that anyone can see he is not the father just by looking at him and the baby. He further complicates the narrative by accusing Ms. Smathers of infidelity around the time she became pregnant, which he uses to bolster his denial. Ms. Smathers' comeback to this bombshell is up next, and it's a doozy. Mr. Stevens, you say that one look at you and the baby is all that anyone needs to see are not the father. And if that's not enough, you claim the plaintiff slept with another man right old you. She's pregnant. Yes, Your Honor. This part tugs at the heartstrings. Ms. Smathers, visibly upset, discusses their relationship history with Mr. Stevens, noting how their relationship deteriorated due to his infidelity. This background sets the stage for understanding the emotional and personal complexities surrounding the paternity dispute. Buckle up, drama escalates quickly after this. Well, Your Honor, me and Mr. Stevens met when I was 16 years old. We went to GED classes together. We eventually started dating. I moved in with him. After that, it went from good to bad. Mr. Stevens started cheating on me. I was always at home with the baby. You know, he was always out with girls. Talk about a plot twist. Ms. Smathers recounts telling Mr. Stevens about her pregnancy and his initial happiness, which later turned into skepticism after she delayed revealing doubts about the paternity. You won't want to miss how this bombshell shakes things up in the courtroom. Ms. Smathers, you find out you're pregnant, you tell Mr. Stevens. What was his response? He was happy. I, I was happy. And, and the aspect is like, you know, she was pregnant, but she waited five months to tell me that there was a possibility that... But, my... oh, so initially when you found out she was pregnant... Like, I was issue. excited, like, because, you know, I found out that it was a boy. So, you know, like, I wanted a first child like, as a boy. Grab your popcorn, folks. A key turn occurs when Ms. Smathers admits to a brief affair, leading Mr. Stevens to suspect that he might not be the father. This revelation intensifies the courtroom drama as it casts doubt on the paternity. Up next, Mr. Stevens pours his heart out, and it's a real tearjerker. And I did open up and say that I was with another man, but I never said that AJ was. It was my conception date was between October 7th and the 11th. We had a hotel party. He was conceived that night. She said that, like, yeah, like, we did it on her birthday. A little bit kind of did it beef. We had talked about getting back together. This moment is a real eye-opener. Mr. Stevens discusses his approach to fatherhood despite doubts, portraying himself as a committed father figure. This moment is poignant as it reflects his internal conflict and dedication to his parental role. The emotional depth here is palpable, and it sets the stage for even more heartfelt confessions. Because I don't see my side of the feature in him. Like, he is he's the lightest. Babies come in all different skin colors. You cannot yeah. judge a baby by what color they come. I know, that's one of his main, that's what I'm trying to get through his head. Just because he has lighter skin doesn't mean he's not his. This part will hit you right in the feels. Mr. Stevens talks about the emotional toll of the situation, showing visible distress over the ongoing uncertainty about his paternity. His emotional investment underscores the personal stakes involved. Wait till you see how a witness's statement throws a wrench into the work. Times, but I try not to because it mess that gives me more doubt. And like, I, I, don't, I just don't want that. Like, I want him, me and him to have a bond. Like, I want us to be able to go fishing. I want us to be able to go hunting and do stuff together. It's like you're trying not to see, but you just feel like you can see. Yeah, like, I don't see myself when I look at him. The tension could be cut with a knife. Ms. Craig, a witness, testifies against Ms. Reese Smathers, claiming she expressed doubts about Mr. Stevens being the father, which contradicts Ms. New Smathers' previous statements and adds another layer of tension. The courtroom reacts with gasps and murmurs. This testimony is a game changer. I know that Mr. Stevens has had doubts about Adrian belonging to him. She told you she had doubts. That's not true. Well, why would she sit up here and lie? She's your friend had expressed to me, we had a conversation, that she had some doubts Josh was the biological father. This testimony really stirs the pot. Ms. Craig's testimony leads to a confrontation in court, with Mr. Stevens feeling validated in his doubts. This segment highlights the complexities of personal relationships and the impact of external opinions on personal doubts. Up next, the DNA results are finally revealed, and the anticipation is off the charts. Yeah, because, like, at the same time, like, is her best friend. She confines her secrets into people that she... With AJ, he's just the ugly duckling of the family, I guess that would be, like, something like that. Like, the rest, all of them match, and then, like, there's this one that doesn't match. All the features line up in all the other children. Yes. And, and then he looks at... Because there's nothing ugly about that baby. I know. Here comes the big reveal. The DNA results are revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Stevens, you are the father. You won't believe this one. Miss Santos states her reason for being in court, claiming the deceased Raymond Cologne is the father of her child. She is challenged by Cologne's mother, who doubts the paternity due to Santos's other relationships at the time of conception. And just when you think you've heard it all, the story takes another twist. Miss Santos, you are here today. Say the love of your life, father of your child, Raymond Cologne was fatally shot just six months ago. You are petitioning the court for a paternity test to prove to his mother was and is father of your 
four-year-old son. Who saw that coming? Miss Cologne expresses her grief and suspicion about Santos's motives, suggesting she is after the deceased's benefits. This sets the stage for the conflict and the emotional stakes involved, highlighting the family's grief and financial implications. But hold on, it's about to get even juicier. You argue that your son, Raymond, is not Miss Sandchild's father because you know she was also sleeping with another man during the time her son was. You believe the only reason Miss Santos is claiming that your son is the father is because she wants to collect his social security and life benefits. Wait, there's more? Santos recounts how her secretive relationship with Cologne began, emphasizing their close upbringing and the complexities of their familial-like relationship. This narrative introduces personal and somewhat taboo nature of their connection, which complicates the paternity issue. Stick around. The secrets are just starting to spill. It was such a secret because me and Raymond grew up together from pampers. Like His cousins. We don't have the same blood running through our system. No, you don't have the but same we blood. we grew up together. That's why it was such a kept this pregnancy such a secret. Can this get any spicier? A family gathering incident is described where playful behavior at a birthday party led to an intimate encounter between Santos and Cologne. This moment is crucial as it transitions their relationship from platonic to romantic, setting the foundation for the paternity dispute. You'll want to see what happens next. Friends with another man, we had relations and everything. It was Raymond's 20th birthday. We were bash for him. Eating good, music good. So I was, you know, feeling it. I was in my little vibe. He came up to me and smashed a cupcake in my face. That's how we always play. When we do a party, if the birthday boy gets lunch a birthday cake. And then what happened? Santos admits to the relationship being more than a one-time thing, revealing multiple encounters with Cologne, which coincided with her pregnancy's conception period. This admission introduces doubt about the child's paternity, reflecting the complex personal decisions and relationships involved. The revelations keep coming, so stay tuned. No, it was one morning. It happened a couple of times that morning. But you were in a relationship with somebody else. Yes, I was. And Raymond knew that. Sexually active with that person yes. as well as Mr. Cologne. And this was around the time of conception. I told Raymond that I was pregnant or whatever because me and Raymond was really close. Is it mine or whatever? And I just looked at him and I was like, no, it can't be because I'm always with the other man. He left it alone right there. He Didn't see that coming, did you? The narrative shifts to after the child's birth, detailing Santos's struggles with the biological father and Cologne's subsequent support. This part highlights Cologne's role in the child's life, raising questions about his potential biological connection and his commitment as a father figure. The emotional stakes are about to hit the roof. I have my son in Florida. When he was about a year old, I came to Chicago hoping that the other man would want a relationship with my son. I have no feelings towards my son whatsoever. Raymond personally told me, he said, well, you know, I heard that the other man kicked you out. He wanted to get an apartment. He didn't want me out into the street. All I have to worry about is cooking and cleaning for him, and he'll take care of the bill. Who could ignore that tension? Miss Cologne firmly believes that Raymond is not the father, citing the child's appearance and her knowledge of Santos's other relationships during the pregnancy. This moment underscores the mother's denial and her emotional turmoil, influenced by her grief and protective instincts toward her son's memory. What's next will have you on the edge of your seat. Raymond is not the father of this baby. Why are you so convinced? What is your doubt? Living with someone else before, doing and after of the pregnancy, the baby don't look nothing like I'm, us. The baby does not have the cologne nose. It's not our you Regardless see, of the fact whether you don't that's see son, any resemblance no, to I your don't. son. I'm not gonna sit here and fight with her. She raised a good man. He died loving my son. Ready for a curveball? The judge discusses the possibility of cologne being the father, reflecting on the timing of the relationships and the slim chance of paternity. This judicial insight brings a legal and probabilistic dimension to the emotional and personal narratives presented. The next part is going to be a doozy. Based upon the time intimate with the boyfriend, with Mr. Cologne, there is a chance he could be the father. A 10% exactly. chance that Raymond could be the father. Chance. Yeah, because we only had sex 10%. Bet you didn't expect that. Miss Cologne discusses her son's secretive behaviors and their impact on her, revealing the deep personal and familial bonds that complicate her acceptance of the situation. Her testimony shows the pain of loss and the difficulty of accepting new, unsettling information following her son's death. But there's more to come. Just you wait. Julius is my son. Let me go talk to my mom and dad and see if they help me pay a DNA test. I could be positive that it is my son. But when they took their trip to Florida last, he could have gone to City Hall, signed his name on the birth certificate. If Raymond thought that it was his son, that it was definitely his son, he would have talked to us. Is there another side to this story? Rosal, Raymond's sister, supports Santos's claim, believing the child is her nephew based on her brother's admission. This test testimony introduces a conflicting family perspective, highlighting the divisions within the family regarding the child's paternity and Raymond's actions. The family saga continues to unfold next. He told me that he had got Sarah pregnant. And I was like, what, are you serious? And so I went and I confronted her. You know, I heard that 
baby might be my brother. And she started laughing. She was like, well, there's a chance that it could be. Me and her hang out all the time. As you know, we grow cousins. Me and her are like always together. Anything because we did grow up as cousins. Thought we were done? The judge summarizes the complex emotions, legal stakes, and family dynamics at play, setting the stage for the DNA results. This culmination reflects the court's role in resolving deeply personal disputes and the broader implications for all involved, especially the child. The climax is just around the corner, and it's a big one. Having to deal with the loss of her son, have a child together, and then on top of that, that he obviously planned a life or all of these things are new to her, and it's just been six months, so you have to understand her level level of resistance is strong because there's so much happening at once. Finding a way to move forward. Are you ready for the big reveal? The DNA test results are revealed. It has been determined that Mr. Raymond Cologne is not <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. The courtroom buzzes with anticipation as Mrs. Watts makes her entrance. Mrs. Watts, representing her tragically deceased son Alex, steps up with doubts about the paternity of the 20-month-old Caden, claimed by defendant Ms. M. Shell to be Alex's son. Ms. Shell is adamant that Alex fathered Caden and is here to prove it through a DNA test. The stage is set for what promises to be a roller coaster of emotions. Just you wait. The emotional roller coaster is just about to take off. Mrs. Watts, you are here on behalf of your deceased son Alex, who was tragically murdered just a few months months ago. You stand here on his behalf because you doubt he fathered the defendant's 20-month-old son, Kate, and you have asked for a DNA test to determine the truth. Yes, Your Honor. The room falls silent as Mrs. Watts takes the stand. Overcome with emotion, Mrs. Watts recounts the violent loss of her sons, describing the heart-wrenching scene she encountered and the subsequent death of Alex at the hospital. This backdrop of tragedy adds a heavy weight to her doubts about Caden's paternity, questioning if the little boy is indeed her grandson. Brace yourself, as Ms. M. Shell's recount of her romance with Alex adds another layer of complexity next. My two sons went to visit a friend who had some type of altercation with some gentlemen prior to my sons coming to visit their home. When my two sons got there, they were ambushed and murdered. Um, oh. When I got to the scene, my older son, he was still at the scene. He died on the scene. He was covered with a sheet. I was told that my son Alex had been taken to the hospital in critical condition. Parts in the courtroom flutter as Ms. M. Shell describes her love story with Alex. She shares intimate details of their relationship, filled with plans for a future cruelly cut short. Her conviction that Alex saw Caden as his son, despite the lack of a biological confirmation, is touching and raises the stakes in the paternity drama. The plot thickens even more with the revelation of some eyebrow-raising text messages up next. We were in love. Every time you seen Alex, he's like, we were always together. We plan on having a family together, having that future together. But fortunately, it was cut short. And so Caden is 19 months old. And so he did get to know his father. Yes. The man you say is his biological father. He passed away. Yes. Hold on to your seats. As Mrs. Watts presents text messages between herself and Ms. M. Shell, the courtroom is gripped. The messages uncover Ms. M. Shell's initial uncertainty about Caden's paternity following a one-night stand, casting a shadow of doubt over her current certainties and complicating the narrative further. As secrets start to spill, the intrigue only grows. Up next, delve into the mysterious nature of Alex's private life. She sent it to me in a text message. Do you have that text message? I do. And you ask, question, are you pregnant by Alan? Miss Sherelle responds, I don't really know. I don't believe so. But at this moment, I don't know. I have to get a blood test. The plot thickens as whispers fill the room. Discussion turns to Alex's penchant for privacy, especially concerning Caden's birth, juxtaposing his open acknowledgement of another daughter. This contrast adds a spicy twist to the paternity puzzle, fueling speculation and doubt about Caden's lineage. But don't wander off. Alex's stepfather is about to shed some more light on the matter. Keep the whole pregnancy see a secret. He did not want nobody to know about the pregnancy. And at the same time, I didn't tell my family I was pregnant either. We both decided to keep a secret. And so you can see how your son may have said, let's keep this to ourselves. Private about other people being in this business. I know him and I had a good relationship and he talked with his stepdad a lot. All ears are on Mr. Gregory Watts as he adds his two cents. Giving a different perspective, he emphasizes that Alex never acknowledged Caden as his own, contrasting sharply with Ms. M. Shell's heartfelt 
assertion. This testimony adds a layer of drama to the already tangled narrative, setting the stage for the bombshell DNA results that are about to drop. He never talked about no babies or nothing. It was like, it's, all this is new to me this year. Wait, yeah, so you... I don't even, he's never even met face to face for him to be able to say, have a say something. I'm talking well, about no. what Alex said. He never said nothing about no baby. If somebody got a child, they gonna say, well, this is my baby here, mama. Look, look at my baby. When you all would have your father's son time, when you would, he never mentioned I have a baby on the way. No. Here comes the moment everyone's been waiting for. DNA results are in. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Lita Watts and Caden is 0.006%. You are not related. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe the roller coaster we just hopped on? Ms. Hendricks breaks down how doubts about her six month old son Isaiah's paternity have shattered her relationship and scattered her family to the winds. She spills her guts about the emotional tornado this has caused. Mr. Pacheco pipes up with his doubts, noting they kicked off when he accidentally eavesdropped on a conversation suggesting another dude claimed to be Isaiah's real dad. Brace yourself because the drama's just heating up. You were once in a committed relationship with the defendant, Mr. Pacheco. You say the doubts about your six month old son Isaiah as paternity has destroyed your relationship or the rest of your family up. Say your doubts about paternity began when you overheard a conversation with Ms. Family Member and another man who claimed to be the baby's father. Yes, Your Honor. Did you catch that bombshell? We dive deeper into the gossip mill that fueled Mr. Pacheco's uncertainties. Ms. Hendricks's brother supposedly dropped a major hint to Mr. Pacheco that he might not be the father, having seen Ms. Hendricks's ex lurking around, which threw their relationship into a nosedive. The crowd's reaction? Audible gas gasps and murmurs, perfectly capturing the tension in the air. Hold tight, it only spirals from here. Be before the ex situation, I heard talking on the phone, the family member was kept telling her, your ex wants me to tell you to tell the baby that I, I love him. If I go to jail, please keep in contact with me. I feel heartbroken. And then I was like, yeah, that's what started giving me more doubt. I think getting more doubts about the situation. Mr. Hendricks here, that is inside of me. You know, he started telling, one day we no, went out. No, that's not true. Talk about a curveball. Amidst the storm, Mr. Pacheco recalls a cutting remark from a family member during a get together, insinuating Isaiah could be the mailman's baby thanks to his light hair and eyes. This snide comment cranks up Mr. Pacheco's doubts and pain, shedding light on the intricate web of family drama and suspicion that surrounds questions of paternity. And guess what? The next scene takes the cake for drama. That her family member came and said- And light skin. Said, oh, that's the mailman's baby. When they said that, I was mad. I walked out, and then an ex at there, whatever time it was, for him to say, oh, that's my son, I love him, I can't wait to see him. When I get out of jail, I wanna just get, keep in contact with you. That's what really hurt me the most. What future do And he's talking do about he an got? ex that I haven't seen. I got with him this summer, me and him got together, is when I cut it off. I haven't seen him since then. This one's a real game changer. Judge Lake steps in with a reality check for Ms. Hendricks, scolding her for tossing out a potentially relationship-ending accusation during a heated argument that Mr. Pacheco might not be the father. The judge's words hammer home the irreversible damage such claims can cause, not just to the individuals involved, but to their entire shared life. You'll want to stick around. The reveal is just around the corner. You can't unring that bell. Now what's yeah. in his mind? Yeah, I understand. I Along understand. with all the other things everybody else? I got relief from the hospital, whatever. I tried, when I got kicked out, I tried to sign the birth certificate. Isaiah Hendricks, not I, Isaiah Pacheco. I cannot make him and Pacheco. for me, but yeah, but every time I called you and I told you for us to How make an I appointment, you never wanted to do it. You always had excuses for every... It's like a process. Here comes the showstopper. The DNA test results are in. Mr. Pacheco, you are his father. And guess what? Buckle up for this emotional roller coaster. The plaintiffs, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Johnson, kick things off fiery accusations, asserting that Mr. Barber fathered their children simultaneously, but has neglected his support duties. They lay out their case with intense emotion, airing their frustrations about Mr. Barber's preferential treatment towards another child. As the audience and judges lean in, the women emphasize their unusual alliance despite previous conflicts. Get ready, because this is just the opening act of today's courtroom drama. Ms. Taylor and Johnson, you both claim that you were pregnant at the same time defendant Mr. Barber's children. Argue that he has not been a father to your kids and but takes care of his other child. In your joint statement, you say that despite having issues with one another in the you are here today united to confront Mr. Barber. Yes. Did that really just happen? Miss Taylor steps up to the financial plate, hitting hard with a claim for $3,608 in child care expenses. Hot on her heels, Miss Johnson also lays out her financial woes, asking for $3,000 $1,880. The air crackles with tension as Mr. Barber counters, attributing his limited support to their high demands and the surrounding drama. Fasten your seatbelts because the stakes are about to get even higher. 
Ms. Taylor, you are suing Mr. Barber for $3,608 in child care. You are also asking the court to award you $3,880 child care expense. Yes, Your Honor. Can you feel the heat in here? The confrontation escalates quickly with biting accusations of favoritism and manipulation flying across the courtroom. Ms. Taylor accuses Mr. Barber of only financially supporting the child of the woman he's still romantically involved with, a claim both Mr. Barber and the other child's mother vehemently deny. As the judge struggles to hammer down order, the courtroom buzzes with anticipation. The next turn in this saga is just around the corner, and it promises to be a doozy. I believe that he supports other child because he's still sleeping with his other child mother. He had three women pregnant at the same time. He is a dog. He doesn't do anything for my child. I have to take care of my... I am talking. You do not interrupt me when I shut your mouth right now and let me talk. Just when you think it's all serious, Mr. Barber's phone rings. Cue the laughter and raised eyebrows as this unexpected ringtone breaks the tension, turning the courtroom into a brief comedy show. Judge Lake seizes the moment to inject a bit of humor, though the ring also hints at the chaos of Mr. Barber's personal life. Don't go anywhere. The revelations just keep coming. Oh, yeah. Mr. Barber, is somebody <laughs> calling you? <laughs> Jerome, answer it and see if it's a woman. Are you know They probably never call and find out you're in fraternity oh, no. court. Cut no, <laughs> it off? Uh, probably would. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. This confession changes everything. Mr. Barber steps into the spotlight, acknowledging paternity for all the children involved, which shifts the narrative towards his responsibilities and alleged absences at critical moments. The emotional stakes are high as deep-seated issues bubble to the surface, painting a complex picture of missed moments and parental neglect. And guess what? There's more drama ahead that you won't want to miss. You wholeheartedly admit that you are the father of all the children. Yes, so if I saw the birth certificate... I've signed every single one of them. Yeah, he's on mine. Oh Miss Taylor. Taylor. Cut the envelope cord and everything. Yeah. Did he cut the form the envelope cord for you? How about you, Cash? Oh, you done started oh, okay. something okay. now. For real? How How bad? Bad? Was, you know that I was there. As emotions run high, Miss Taylor shares a deeply personal and painful episode. She recounts the loneliness and struggle of giving birth alone, underscoring Mr. Barber's sporadic presence and lack of support. This heart-wrenching testimony not only showcases her resilience, but also casts a long shadow over Mr. Barber's claims of fatherhood. The air is thick with tension, setting the stage for yet another explosive revelation. I had my daughter by myself. My mother's deceit. My family could not get there. He was not there. I called him and told him that I was being induced. Never know when the baby's gonna come. He stayed for the first 24 hours and he left. I didn't later. show up, but why? What did I later. tell you I was doing? Do what was I, I doing? Know. I was at work! As the judge gears up to lay down the law, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Moving towards a resolution, the discussion pivots to financial responsibilities and past neglect. Mr. Barber faces the music, admitting his failures and expressing a desire to make amends. The atmosphere is charged with anticipation. What will the judge decide? Stay tuned, because the verdict is bound to shake things up. But I also see how frustrated. I see a man who's admitting pretty much I blew it. You got two of your children's mothers standing at the same podium. You two go to speak. I took a moment to just observe you. And there's no understanding, no cation, no compromise, no resolution when you all are going at each other like that. In a surprising twist, Miss Cooper steps up with a fresh angle. She suggests Mr. Barber has the potential to be a good father, despite the ongoing turmoil with Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson. Her insights suggest that personal vendettas might be clouding the co-parenting water, introducing a new layer of complexity to the drama. As this new information settles, the narrative takes a sharp turn. Keep watching, the intrigue is about to deepen. No, I don't. I feel like he loves all his kids the same. I just feel like me and him have came to a common ground to co-parent. Our relationship and what we've been through, none of that matters. She's the daddy's girl. She's the only one to say all that. The time. So you think he is capable of being a good father to their children? Of course. And in your estimation, since you know him, what do you think is stopping him? Because he acknowledges paternity. As the financial documents come under scrutiny, the courtroom holds its breath. Detailed expenses laid out by Miss Taylor spotlight the real costs of raising a child, pressing Mr. Barber to confront his financial obligation head on. With everyone hanging on every word, the judge prepares to deliver a ruling that could flip the script. Don't switch channels now. Climax is just moments away. Now these expenses that you have presented accurately depict what it takes to raise a child. Now, do you have anything to add before I make my ruling? You know, it is this court's opinion that Miss Taylor is in fact entitled to $3,600 $8 in back child care expenses. As the final gavel prepares to strike, the air is filled with a mix of hope and tension. You have a responsibility to share in those expenses, and for that reason, I am awarding the $3,880 she's requesting for this court judgment for Johnson. Cash, please.
But I did hear between the lines a level of truth that I want to explain to you that I am because I want you to do better. When you got these women pregnant, you didn't know who you were.